Welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon to celebrate the life of Priscilla Murray. My name is Doug Shapiro. I'm an acting company member of the Barnstormers going on 16 years this summer, and I'm honored to share some love for Priscilla, who welcomed me so warmly when I was a baby Barnstormer back in 2001. Uh, when Francis and Alice Cleveland hired Cope Murray as a juvenile actor in 1958, little did they realize what a bonus they were going to receive. Cope's wife Priscilla came along for the ride, and what a ride it was. Everything from uh, starting with Sleeping Prince and riding, I think, along four or five ghost trains, <laughs> their final performance. Um, but in that first production of the 1958 season, Sleeping Prince, Cope had no lines. He was an extra. So his job was to open doors so that the speaking actors, including his wife, could just walk on through. What an entrance. Uh, married for only a year, that could have been grounds for divorce. <laughs> Priscilla Murray appeared in over 150 productions with the Barnstormers. She made her audience laugh, she made them cry, and she was one of the most outstanding actresses in Barnstormers history. Uh, Priscilla, also uh, following in the footsteps of Barnstormer founder Alice Cleveland, was also a member of the historic Tamworth Onway Bridge Club. She was the treasurer and woe to the member who was late with their dues. Some of you are still delinquent in your dues, and you know she will haunt you from beyond the grave. My suggestion, pay promptly. This afternoon's celebration of Priscilla's life will feature selected videos and audio, more slides of her performances than you can shake a stick at, and of course, um, comments and love from her fellow Barnstormers actors, the son of one of her favorite Barnstormers actors, and of course, finally, her daughter, Nancy. And let's begin our tribute. Next slide. So here is Priscilla Lamari in a scene from Chekhov's Three Sisters. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Next slide. Not so much with the gorgeous. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, please note the contrast in her acting technique. <laughs> uh, this is Priscilla in Home, the first time we did Home at the Barnstormers. The second time we performed Home with the Barnstormers, um, it featured Barnstormers' favorite, Vinette Cotter, who I'm very proud to introduce to you right now. Hi. The first time I met Pris on stage, she was a whore. <laughs> no, really, she was. And a very good one. It was the Three Penny Opera, and Pris, Sue Riskin, and Jean Brown were the most unlikely trio of prostitutes you ever want to be. But they threw themselves into it with surprising gusto. I'll just leave it at that. I'm sorry to say I didn't work that much with Pris, but it was my pleasure to get to know her over the years, and an honor to do the same character she had done previously in Home, a picture which you see behind me with Pris and Kay Hawking from 1973. My fondest memories of Pris were off stage, when she and Nicole would come for Thanksgiving, and there was this wee little waif-like lady sitting at the table, chopping down on a turkey leg almost as big as she was, <laughs> and leaving nothing but the bone or coming to our Christmas parties, <clears throat> filling out their ballots for our Oshka parties, and brunch at the common man, taking her to an Irish pub before we realized that she hated Irish music. <laughs> Great memories. I came across a little poem by Billy Collins I'd like to end with. The dead are always looking down on us, they say while we are putting on our shoes or making a sandwich. They are looking down through the glass bottom boat of heaven as they roll themselves slowly through eternity. They watch the top of our heads moving below on earth. And when we lie down in a field or a couch, drugged perhaps by the hum of a warm afternoon, they think we are looking back at them which makes them lift their oars and fall silent and wait, like parents, for us to close our eyes. Thank you.
Next slide, please. All right, so here is Priscilla performing her famous Sunny Boy routine. Here's how it would go. A man, in this case, Jill Melward, would be attempting to sing the song Sunny Boy as Priscilla, playing the aforementioned Sunny Boy, would constantly interrupt him by asking him questions and smacking him with her teddy bear. Um, this was a routine that only she could do, and those who saw it never forgot it, including Cope, when he first saw her at Emerson College as a student performing this very same routine. Sunny boy, though you're only three, sunny boy, you no way of knowing, there's no way of showing what you mean to me, sunny boy. When there are gray skies, I don't mind the gray skies, you make them blue. Sunny boy, friends may forsake me, let them all forsake me, I still have you, sunny boy. You're sent from heaven, and I know your worth, you made a heaven for me right here. featured Priscilla in one of her favorite parts, acting opposite one of her favorite actors, human beings, um, barnstormer great Dan Rubinett. And at this time, I'm very pleased to introduce Dan's son, Michael Rubinett. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Murray was like an aunt to me, as you, Mr. Murray, like an uncle. Always present in my life for as long as I can remember, and always a core reason for coming up to New Hampshire. The memories, stories, and interactions are endless. Likewise, I feel very grateful that she was a prominent presence in my life and made an everlasting impression. From going back to being a small child when she would babysit, making myself and my siblings lunch, and her disapproving stare through the window at Peter and I throwing sand around waving the finger. <laughs> her candidness also provided many laughs and was usually wrapped up with a true in-your-face approach. For example, the time she saw me with a Stephen King book, whom she did not like, so for the hell of it, she read the last chapter and told me. <laughs> told me the end of it. I was more impressed with her gumption than I was disappointed with knowing the ending, but, or the time she served clam chowder for lunch, and I was very impressed. I said, Mrs. Murray, how did you do this? It's easy, I opened a can and poured it into a pot. <laughs> so it was right to the point. I always remember her fast, amusing, and very honest answers. And what I always expected, when we arrived in Tamworth and get out of the car, I was ready for the Mrs. Murray greeting when she saw me, standing 10 feet away with a cigarette, like this. <laughs> Pete, do you remember uh, one of my many visits on Wanna Lancet? We went uh, just trekking up the road somewhere. On the way back, we saw three figures in the distance. Yourself, Mrs. Murray, and Nancy. At which point, Mrs. Murray projected out in true Brooklyn fashion, Where were you guys? It's nearly six. Pete and I said, Sorry. Never mind, sorry. I'm mad. I remember feeling like I was heading back to a firing squad. But much to my surprise, I could tell she was trying not to laugh when we entered the house. Again, I'm grateful. 
Now's the time to celebrate her life. Likewise, keeping her vibrant spirit alive in our hearts. Priscilla's role in Velvet Glove tapped into her role as moral compass of the Tamworth community. <laughs> she would be glad to offer guidance as soon as she downed her bourbon and water. Next slide, please. <laughs> Twigs was Priscilla's true tour de force. She played four different roles, a mother and three daughters, four acts. It was a triumph of one of the great barnstormer performances. All right, so here's the story. It is the last act. And um, Priscilla is playing the role of the mother. Um, Francis was extremely nervous. This is going to be a theme of Francis being nervous in dress rehearsal throughout this. Um, and he was debating. He was hemming and hawing, like, should I allow it? the last line in the script? Can we say this? His barn service audience, it's a family audience. Can we say this in the script? It's kind of central. What should we do? And then he looks at Priscilla and says, well, if anyone can get away with it, Priscilla can. <laughs> Bullshit, she exclaimed, and the house came down. Um, we are now very lucky uh, to, enough to have the audio from one of the acts in which Priscilla plays one of the daughters. Enjoy. Well, he's a disgrace to his country. Why did he go to Africa or Russia if he don't like it here, huh? I mean, who did he fight? Punks, lilies, and they're all punks today. They couldn't hold a water bucket to the guys. Hey, listen, right, listen, right, listen right, I, right. I was going to sing you that ballad from the motion picture I was in, you know, He Loves Me Not. Oh, it was so beautiful and all sweet. You really would have liked it. But I decided that I'd do the other number instead because what we need here is something more rousing. No, it was no easy number to learn, believe you me. Come on, sweet. You, you, you sit down here. I can't wait for you to see it just the way it was. Oh, you're probably laughing at everything. I mean, well, I was a lot younger then, huh? <laughs> Certainly. Now, now remember that there was five other girls and me. Oh, they were such beautiful girls. And we had on these white fur chubby coats, they called them, and hats to match. And underneath the coats, we had on these beautiful sequin costumes. And on our feet, we had on these very expensive silver tap shoes. Oh, it was fabulous. Okay, you ready? You ready now? Okay, now watch. Okay? <clears throat> now, first, there was this big introduction. Choo, 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 choo. We was all standing sideways, moving like a train, see? Choo, 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 choo. Hollywood and Vine, that paving Hollywood and Vine. We're saving every cent we earn. And here we held up a penny, a real one. Every cent we earn, just so we can journey to who? Hollywood and Vine. Woo, woo, woo! Hollywood and Vine. The mobs there. And here we were all leaning out of train windows. The mobs there standing in the line. By Schwab's there, fingerprints and feet, right across the street, all at Hollywood and Vine, the place where. And here we formed a line and put our arms around each other and moved our heads and our feet perfectly together. Oh, it was sweet. The place where Metro Goldwyn Mayer and Fox and Universal stand, the place where everybody's always tan. Take us there, the place where we can mingle with the czars, ride in big black chauffeur cars, where we'll get more than halfway to the stars. Like Garble, Gable, and a stair. Now some of the girls never did get this step. Hollywood and Vine. There's Pick there, Hollywood and Vine. Look, there's Pick there. Let us off the train before we go insane and take us to the sign that's known as Hollywood. Hollywood. All right, knock it off. Features Priscilla with Dave Neil Brown and uh, Cope showing off his assets. Next slide, please. 
Oh, here's Chris with Will Cavill in Something's Afoot. It is a musical version of Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None. Chris was awfully good with Agatha Christie, as we shall see in this next video. Oh, good evening, Mr. Rope. The family's been expecting you. They're in the library now. Thank you, Mrs. Hogan. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you happened to know when Mr. Dutton came back tonight. I don't know. How should I? He's got his own key, he had. He did go out, didn't he? Of course he went out. Oh, slammed the door fit to shake the house, he did. Now, he was in a temper, if you ask me. He'd a nasty temper. I've seen it more than once. Do you know if anyone came to the house tonight? It seems someone saw a man coming around to the back door. A great hulking brute? What do you mean with your nasty puns? Puns? You said hulking, didn't you? Oh, yes, it was hulk right enough. Caging round as usual. I had to give him half me week's wages before he'd take himself off. Bit the worse he was, too. And that's not unusual. I'm really sorry, Mrs. Holt. I had no idea. I really didn't know it was your husband. <laughs> well, maybe you did, and maybe you didn't. But it was him right enough. So I gave up the money. It's all he's ever wanted from me anyways. And then I went and drawed the curtains. I can't remember when rightly. It would have been lighter than usual, a winter supper being put off like it was. So if the gentleman says it was a 25 past, then I won't say any different, I won't. If Mr. Darden had been sitting or lying behind the screen at the time, would you have noticed him? Well, now, that I can't say neither. I might, and again, I might not. As in, I don't see too good without me glasses, I don't. In point of fact, though, you didn't see him, did you? No. No, I didn't. That's a fact. I understand Mr. Dudden had a beer with his dinner. That he did. <laughs> but if you ask me, he'd had head start. That sort of thing was not beyond him, it wasn't. But he had only one with dinner. He did. I put it out myself when I set the table. And there it sat until dinner was served ten minutes later. So if he was indulging himself in more, I, for one, can't say where he was getting it. And that's the Lord's truth. And what time did you serve dinner tonight? At exactly eight o'clock. And I know that for sure, because the clock was chiming, and it always chimes exactly on the hour. And it was chiming tonight when I called the family in to dinner. Do you happen to know if Mr. Dudden was taking any medication? Well, I don't know for sure. A maid's job is not to be minding other people's business when she's supposed to be minding her own. Well... Perhaps he may have kept that private. Some people are like that. Where are the medicines kept? In the closet at the top of the stairs. Oh, you can't miss it. Next to the bathroom, you know. He's dead, is he? because they're fuzzy, one of her great loves. Uh, she gave tons of money to do the Humane Society, uh, tons of money, another great Priscilla Varia performance. Um, but here's Priscilla with Jason the Cat in A Girl Can Get Lucky. Um, so we return to dress rehearsal time, and again, Francis is rather nervous, and he asks Pris, do you think it's wise to leave Jason unattended on the counter like that? Oh, he won't move, answered Pris, unless I tell him to. <laughs> Rope, as you can see, was in the play as well, and you always said the play should have been called A Guy Can Get Lucky. <laughs> and now we are very lucky to have a few words from another barn server favorite, Penny Purcell. Cold 
introduced me to Priscilla almost 40 years ago at New England College. Uh, at New England College, she came down from Tamworth to see all the shows he directed there. When I came to Tamworth to join the Barnstormers, they let me stay in their home while they summered in their cottage in Wanalanson. Everything in their home had Pris's touch. She collected blue flow china, belief china from Ireland, early American cabinets, ladder back chairs and tables. She even stenciled the walls, very warm and inviting, like Priscilla herself. She introduced, she introduced me to everything Barnstorms. I sat next to her downstairs in the dressing room for 20 years. She came in early, went over her script, put it to the side, and never referred to it again. She put on her makeup, which consisted of a bottle of foundation, lipstick for both lips and cheeks, liner for eyes and brows. She put up with quite of my nervous chatter before shows, till one day she told me that she was completely deaf in her left ear. <laughs> she put up with quite a bit of, I'm uh, sorry. Back in the 80s, we did a show called Sun. Francis had remembered it from his youth. Francis lasted one day in rehearsal and retreated up the hill. <laughs> Turning over the direction to Hal Meyer. The word crap was used a lot in that show. I'm not saying the show was crap. It was just used in the place of crop. Never, nevertheless, we didn't think the show was going to work. But on the strength of Priscilla's performance as mother, it was an unexpected hit. A British patron commented to me that her performance reminded her of Dame Peggy Ashcroft. Chris could play anything. She, hated, she had great comic timing and could sing too, as you could hear in that last audio. Unfortunately, she was a baritone. <laughs> her portrayal of Miss Prism in Earnest in Love is one of my favorites. When she broke into metaphorically speaking, her booming voice filled the theater. She was a rock on stage as far as lines. She was unflappable even when there was chaos and breaking up going on. She would always remain in character. In the play Ten Nights in a Barroom, Bill Moodis, the hero, presents Pris the Widow with the mortgage deed to her home, which he has rescued from the dastardly villain. I wish I could remember the line, but the way it should have ended, but instead, Bill Muda said to her, Here, Mom, now we can all go home and relieve ourselves. <laughs> How she kept a straight face. <laughs> but she sure had a good laugh afterwards. <laughs> she was always a gracious host. I have spent many evenings with her and Cope and the kitties. She had an incredible memory after all the shows that she performed in. If there was ever a question as to who played what, she always knew the answer. I will never forget all the support she has given me all these years. She was a true friend. This summer I will have a corn fest in her honor. I will enjoy the, a few years, probably not as many as Chris's record, which I think was over 20. <laughs> Thank you for being my friend, teaching me to snap out of it when I become self-indulgent, and teaching me how to knit. Ping, ping, Chris. Good show. Uh -huh. uh, can we go back one? Yes. Beautiful. As you can see, our town was ever more beautiful, Mrs. Webb. Now going on. And this is Sunup, uh, the show that Penny was just talking about. She could smoke a corn cob pipe with the best of them. Extremely, extremely steady. And Chris was an amazing study in versatility. And now we have some words from another incredibly versatile Barnstormers actor, Ms. Jean Mar Brown. I met Chris in 1978 in my first summer at the Barnstormers. I got to know her at a theater party where we stayed up very late talking about everything. I learned how responsive and warm and smart she was, and I appreciated her ever since. She was fun and talented and kind, and her dry wit and observations always endeared me to her. She was also a modest, private, and undemanding person. You never felt that you had to perform for Pris. Some people have that respectful presence. Pris was one of them. 
Here are some of the special things I remember about Chris. Her memory. Before there was Google, there was Chris. <laughs> Couldn't think of the name of a book, author, movie, or play? Just go ask Chris. Her memory was a trove of lost treasure. That elusive play we did 20 years ago whose name completely escaped us, Chris would know it. She always did. And then there was her comic timing, her wonderful sense of comedy. My first summer at the Barnstormers, Chris was in the melodrama, Ten Nights in a Barroom, and was so funny by being so deadpan, so serious, playing a gloomy mother whose son has gone astray. Many years later, I had to play the same part, and I wanted so much to channel her. No one could do deadpan like Chris. <laughs> and then there was Chris the professional, on and off stage. In the dressing room, she was a steady and diplomatic presence. She was private and pleasant, and established a nice order to a potentially hyperactive atmosphere, several actresses getting ready to go on stage. Chris didn't talk much in the dressing room, but once when an actress was grumbling about her assigned role, Chris efficiently and effectively took charge of the situation, setting her straight with very few but well-chosen words. And that was the end of that. It was a brilliant performance. And then there was Chris as fun, reliable, and creative. My special connection with Chris was working on one-act plays that we performed for the Arts Council in the 90s. We had to choose the plays that would work for just the two of us and try to make an evening of it. It was challenging, from reading lots of plays to selecting possible ones to deciding on the best ones. And we always agreed. We always had the same reasons for eliminating certain one acts and for ultimately choosing the ones we did. And one acts can be very odd. It was such a mutual endeavor from our selection to our costumes to the set. I feel very sentimental about working with her. She was so reliable and responsive. We were both nervous wrecks, but willing to take on these projects three times, three years. We had a lot of laughs together. One of our choices was a play by David Mamet called Duck Variations. It was designed for two men talking about life on a park bench with no swearing. We thought, why not two women? The lines were really hard to learn, but with Chris as a partner, you couldn't get anyone more reliable or fun. Lines like, what a life. Ducks. They go south. They come back. They live. Many years ago, Chris gave me, Chris gave me cuttings from her perennial flower garden, and those are the only flowers that always come back and always live in my garden. Chris. You will always live on in our memory and our hearts, but we miss you. So as well as doing contemporary plays, I guess contemporary at the time, meaning 1960s, 1970s, um, Priscilla was a classical actress as well, as exemplified by one of her great performances as the queen in Shakespeare's great play, The Tragedy of Baldrick. Um, allow me, allow, allow a better wordsmith than I to make this introduction, ladies and gentlemen, Francis Cleveland. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and contributors, welcome to the first production of the Barnstormers Classical Group. <laughs> Next year we are preparing a uh, the uh, Manecti of Plautus in the original Latin. <laughs> I think I should give you a slight background before we begin the play tonight, which is a very short play, I may add. Uh, many of you are probably wondering why these fragments of lost Shakespeare uh, um, regalia <laughs> ended up here in Tamworth. Well, the thought is, and I'm quite sure that this is true, that they were meant for Tamworth, England. And that either they got mixed up with the zip code or something. <laughs> but uh, anyway, they ended up here. Now, when I was a selectman in the 50s, we were looking through the town's vault, and way in back, underneath the town report for 1803, were these very damp, 
and uh, muddy, dirty slips of paper. And I looked at them and I thought, my gracious me, this does look like Shakespeare's handwriting. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I uh, began to study these things and uh, I found that actually I had something here of great value, something uh, that is an in inestimable value, in fact. These were, uh, as you might say, works of the young Shakespeare, as we refer to the young Mozart. Uh, in my research on this, which has taken me 30 years, I had the help of various uh, very eminent people. I had the help of uh, Professor uh, Lily Edgehurst of the University of St. Peter the Great in Wigsmere on Thames, Little Oxford, Perthshire, England. <laughs> And also the help of uh, Professor E. Strasby Hayatala of the University of East Isla, Nigeria, uh, professor of philology. And Professor Emeritus Rory P. Oppheimer, fellow of the Colleges of Ancient Languages and Etymology uh, in Alaska. <laughs> uh, these gentlemen were very helpful to me. With the recrudescence of interest in Shakespeare, I felt that the it was incumbent upon me to somehow put these fragments together. And one of the things that I found was an epilogue to a play that he had planned. I will deliver the epilogue at the end of the play, but I can't do it now because it would give away the play. But needless to tell you, it was very difficult to put these together into a coherent whole. And uh, I have... Uh, done so to the best of my ability uh, and as I tell you uh, the, the, the conventional Shakespearean producers scoffed at me and said you cannot do this this is not authentic but it's been authenticated by these three gentlemen that I mentioned <laughs> uh, consequently there is no question that these were the work of William Shakespeare How now, thy sacred majesty? Why dost drag thy body, bulbous self, into this charmless coin? For by thy countenance, full flushed and somewhat flabby flown, <laughs> I see there is some noxious pleasantry afoot, which ill betides my desperandum pet. <laughs> I have small Latin and less Greek. <laughs> so speak to me within our own native savage tongue, or by my pendant parts, I'll melt thy cowish visage with the fraud and turmoil to my conquering eye. But we shall win, and we shall sit again upon that vacant throne, vicarious and voluptuous whereon suave hinder parts, more graceful and genteel, have filled the graceful, graceful, gentle lines, and fair and foppish farts have often rent the general ear to noisome and collective satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> But I do fear to swift and bold a move. For shame. If it were done, it best were done quickly. For why for shall we wait in idle earth when with a strong and destined thrust we may outflank and mortify those aspirants whose looks and whispers bode us no goodwill. Go thou, therefore, unto our mockish son, a pimpled princeling lying still abed, <laughs> unmindful of the subterranean roar of subjects torn agape by inklings of revolt most hazardous, which may destroy and devastate the outcome of our day.
that she took up. She loved her bridge group. She loved her pets, her cats. She loved the foxgloves and the iris and the forget-me-nots that my father always forgot not <laughs> to mow <laughs> in the yard of their one a Lancet home. She forgave him his faux pas and she adored her husband. She loved board games. She would joyfully take Kamchatka while denying my brother and myself any attempt at will domination. <laughs> she loved the smell of the heat gun while she refinished her houses, scraping up lead paint with her bare hands from the floorboards and the wainscoting of her house. But what she had a passion for was her beloved Tamar, her beloved Juana Lanza. She had a passion for this community, for this building, for this institution, for all the audiences that ever appreciated her well-crafted performances, usually as a maid. <laughs> What you may not know about my mother, however, is that she had a passion for dairy products. <laughs> now, let me take a step back. When a loved one passes, you struggle with your relationship with them. How do you affect their legacy? How are they part of you? There's science, there's nature, there's nurture, there's genetics there's learned behavior, there's rebellion. But how do you go on without them? I heard about a study, as I was struggling to put together some words, I heard about this study about a group of children that enjoyed certain foods that their parents had, or their mothers had enjoyed when they were pregnant, and relished and craved these foods. My dad told me a story told me a story about when they were a young couple living in Portland, Maine. And because they lived in Portland, Maine, lobster was cheap. My mother got to eat lobster almost every night. She was pregnant with me. Now, I thought about that scientific study, and I said, ah, I don't think I can use that. I don't really care for lobster. <laughs> but then I thought, no, what is lobster? Lobster is a conduit for butter. <laughs> now, my mother and I, we had our difficulties and we disagreed on many things, but the one thing that we absolutely agreed on was that any food could be made better by the addition of butter, and generally, a lot of it. <laughs> now, Chris, she was no chef de cuisine but give her a stainless steel pot with a copper bottom, a quart of water, and magic could happen in her kitchen. She was the master of the 20-minute hard-boiled egg. <laughs> Maxwell House instant coffee. And for those of you that can remember this product from the 60s and 70s, which basically means everybody in here except maybe my children, <laughs> the boil-in vegetable bag. <laughs> now, 
Give my mother a roaring boil, a vegetable bag, and 20 minutes, and she could make glorious green peas and oatmeal. <laughs> now me, I'm not so good with boiling water. I can't make a cup of tea. I have problems with rice. I'm marginal with pasta, and my instant potatoes are a little sticky. <laughs> but my mother taught me how to boil real potatoes in real water. <laughs> she taught me how to add cream and butter. <laughs> and my family will attest to you that I make potatoes to die for. In more ways than Now, is that nature? Is that nurture? Is it genetics or science? I don't know, but I am truly my mother's daughter. <laughs> Now, my mother had many meals that she made during the week. And one that we particularly look forward to, maybe the only one we look forward to, was something we called noodle casserole. Huh. Now, noodle casserole involved my mother boiling water, wide mother's egg noodles, stirring the pot and munching on the raw pasta as she stirred. <laughs> she would open a can of to whole tomatoes in juice, dump them on top of the pasta, dot the pasta with one stick of butter, <laughs> top the pasta with American cheese, put into the oven at 350 degrees for 20 minutes. It was buttery, cheesy. <laughs> My children are the only two children in the United States of America that do not like spaghetti and spaghetti sauce or anything tomato. They will eat this meal and they enjoy it. Again, nature, nurture, science, genetics, I don't know, but they are Priscilla's grandchildren. Now my mother, she had a sweet tooth. One day, we're waiting for my father. We lived in England, and we're waiting for my father, and he was at an appointment, and it was raining out. We had this big blue on blue car called a Woolsey. It looked like a police car. <laughs> <laughs> and she took me into a bake shop. And there she bought a cheesecake. It was the size of a wheel of camembert cheese. <laughs> and I was so excited because dessert was such a treat in our household. And I thought, this is great dessert for a week. We got into the car. She ripped off a piece and handed it to me. And we began to eat this cheesecake. It was awful. It was dry. But we laughed, and she told me stories about growing up in Philadelphia and how wonderful the cheesecake was there, and all the things that she did when she was a child. And we laughed and giggled, and we ate the entire thing while we <laughs> Now, when I grew up and I learned how to bake, I thought the one thing I would love to do for my mother would be to give her that Philadelphia experience. So. I started baking cheesecakes, and we had many, many cheesecakes. And I would say, what do you think now, Mom? And she would take a little bite, and she'd say, um, maybe a little cheese, maybe a little butter. It's not what they did. And she would laugh. <laughs> so I kept trying and trying. And she would say to me, oh, maybe just one more piece. Maybe just one more piece. And then I'll know for sure. But it was always not quite good enough. After a while, I gave up and I tried a new dessert. And I thought she might really, really like this one. Because it contained two of her favorite <laughs> ingredients. Two cups of heavy cream and two pounds, yes, I said two pounds of butter. <laughs> it was a seven layer chocolate ganache cake. And trust me, the chocolate was so incidental to the cream. <laughs> now, she loved this cake and she 
repeatedly asked for it. But after a few years, I had been practicing the cheesecake. And I said to her, you know, maybe this time, let's try another cheesecake, Mom. I think I have it. And she said to me, well, I really like this chocolate cake. Uh, I think this is fine. And I said, but Mom, I've been practicing that cheesecake, and I think I've really got it now. And she said, you know, honey, all those years, it was really fine. I really love them, and they were just as good as anything I had in Philadelphia. And I said to her, well, what do you mean? Did you trick me? She said, yeah, I wanted you to make more. <laughs> Shoulder, Frank Wells and Dennis Quinn for the major roles you played in helping to put this tribute together. And we now present to you a montage of slides from Priscilla's life and career, accompanied by a finale of her favorite musical, Underneath the Arches. And after this final montage, please join us for a reception right up uh, Cleveland Hill Road at Highland House.
Shanks is poly when I'm scrolling.